crowd will try not to take it all up. Um, let me start with a health warning. My speech is not suitable for children, which is sadly ironic given that all of the extreme and inappropriate material I'm about to share has already been shared with children in our schools. As a former biology teacher, I've delivered my fair share of sex education, and teaching the facts of life often comes with more than a little embarrassment for teachers and pupils alike. And I remember teaching about reproduction when I was about 30 weeks pregnant with my first baby. One child asked me if my husband knew I was pregnant. Another, having watched a video on labour and birth, commented, Miss, that's really going to hurt, you know. Just as children don't know about photosynthesis or the digestive system without being taught, neither do they know the facts of reproduction. So it's important that children are taught clearly and truthfully about sex, and of course there's a lot more to sexual relationships than just anatomy. Now many people believe that parents should take the leading role in teaching children about relationships, since one of the main duties of parenting is to pass on wisdom and values to children. Nevertheless, there are families where parents can't or don't teach children effectively about relationships, and it's also sadly now the case that the internet presents children with a vast array of false and damaging information about sex. So there is widespread consensus that schools do have a role to play in relationships and sex education. And that's why the government chose to make the teaching of relationships and sex education compulsory in all secondary schools from September 2020, with the aims, according to the guidance, of helping children manage their academic, personal and social lives in a positive way. But less than two years later, the current education secretary has written to the Children's Commissioner asking for her for help in supporting schools to teach RSE because, in his words, we know that the quality of RSE is inconsistent. Mr Chairman, my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, is right that the teaching of sex education is inconsistent. Unlike maths or science or history, there are no widely adopted schemes of work or examinations, and so the subject matter and materials do vary widely between different schools. But inconsistency should be the least of my right, on, right honourable friend's concerns when we look at the reality of what is actually being taught. Because despite its good intentions, the new RSE framework has opened the floodgates to a whole host of external providers who offer sex education materials to schools, and now children across the country are being exposed to a plethora of deeply inappropriate, wildly inaccurate, sexually explicit and damaging materials in the name of sex education. This is extremely concerning for a number of reasons. Firstly, if we fail to teach children clearly and factually about relationships, sex and the law, they will be exposed to all sorts of risks. For example, if you define sex as anything that makes you horny or aroused, the definition offered by the sex education provider, the School of Sexuality Education, how does a child understand the link between sex and pregnancy? The Sex Education Forum tells children they fall into one of two groups, menstruators or non-menstruators. If a teenage girl's periods don't start, what will she think? How does she know this isn't normal? How does she know to consult a doctor? How will she know she's not pregnant? Will she just assume she's one of the non-menstruators? The book for teachers, Great Relationships and Sex Education, suggests an activity for 15-year-olds where children are given prompt cards and have to say whether they think certain types of sexual acts are good or bad. How do the children know which acts come with risks of health, health risks or risks of pregnancies or STDs? If we tell children that love has no age, the slogan used in a diversity role models resource, do we undermine their understanding of the legal age of consent? Sex education provider Bish informs children that most people would say they had a penis and testicles or a clitoris and a vagina. However, many people are in the middle of the spectrum with how their bodies are configured. Now, as a former biology teacher, I don't even know to, where to start with that one. As adults, we often fail to remember what it's like to be a child, and we make the mistake of assuming that children know more than they do. But children have all sorts of misconceptions, and that's why it's our responsibility to teach them factually, truthfully, and in age-appropriate ways so that they can make informed decisions. Another concern relates to the teaching of consent. Of course, it's vitally important to teach about consent, and the Everyone's Invited revelations make this abundantly clear. But we must remember that under the law, children can't consent to sex. 
Sex education classes conducted by the group It Happens told boys of 13 and 14 that the law is not there to punish young people for having consensual sex. It's just two 14-year-olds who want to have sex with each other and who are consensually having sex. It's not hard to see the risks of this approach, which normalises and legitimises underage sex. Not only are children legally not able to consent, they also don't have the developmental maturity or capacity to consent to sexual activity. That is the point of the age of consent. The introduction of graphic or extreme sexual material in sex education lessons also reinforces the porn culture that is damaging our children in such a devastating way. Of course, it is not the fault of schools that half of all 14-year-olds have seen pornography online, much of it violent and degrading. But some RSE lessons are actively contributing to the sexualisation and adultification of children. The Proud Trust has produced a dice game encouraging children to discuss explicit sexual acts based on the role of a dice. The six sides of the dice name different body parts, such as anus, vulva, penis, mouth and objects. Two dice are thrown and children must name a pleasurable sexual act that can take place between those two body parts. The game is aimed at children of 13 and over. SexWise is a website run and funded by the Department for Health and recommended in the Department for Education's RSE guidance. The website is promoted in schools and contains the following advice. Maybe you read a really hot bit of erotica while looking up dominance and submission. Remember, sharing is caring. Sex education materials produced by BISH training involve discussion of a wide range of sexual practices, some of them violent. This includes rough sex, spanking, choking, BDSM and kink. BISH is aimed at young people of 14 and over and provides training materials for teachers. Even when materials are not extreme, we must still be careful not to sexualise children prematurely. I spoke to a mother who told me how her 11-year-old son had been shown a PowerPoint in a lesson on sexuality, setting out characteristics and behaviours and asking children to read through the lists and decide if they were straight, gay or bisexual. Prepubescent 11-year-olds are not straight, gay or bisexual, they are children. And even school's Diversity Week, a celebration of LGBTQIA+, promoted by the Just Like Us group, leads to the sexualisation of children. Of course schools should celebrate diversity and promote tolerance. But why are we doing this by asking pre-sexual children to align themselves with adult sexual liberation campaigns? And let's not forget that the plus includes kink, BDSM and fetish. Should you I certainly will. Um, uh, um, I was quite well with Rugby Way. She's giving a, a very illuminating speech. But can I just ask her, uh, the material she's talking about, talk about you know, the, the detailed practice of sexual acts, yet as a, full, as a biology teacher herself, is there not proper boundaries that teachers have to respect in terms of teaching sex education that doesn't get into talking about behaviours, which really strays into a, a relationship that teachers and children shouldn't have? Well, I thank my honourable friend uh, for her intervention, and there is guidance, which I will come on to, but the problem is that the guidance is often very vague and open to interpretation, and that's something that I, will, I will absolutely come on to uh, in my remarks. But even primary schools aren't immune from using inappropriate materials. An All About Me programme developed by Warwickshire Con County Council's Respect Yourself team introduces six- and seven-year-olds to rules about touching yourself. I recently spoke to a mother in my constituency who was distraught that her six-year-old had been taught about masturbation in school. Sexualising children, encouraging them to talk about intimate details with adults, breaks down important boundaries and makes them more, success more susceptible and available to sexual predators both on and offline. Another significant concern is the use of RSE to push extreme gender ideology. Gender ideology is a belief system that claims that we all have an innate gender that may or may, may or may not align with our biological sex. Gender ideology claims that rather than sex being determined at conception and observed at birth, it is assigned at birth and that doctors sometimes get it wrong. Gender theory sadly has sexist and homophobic undertones, pushing outdated gender stereotypes and suggesting to, to, suggesting to same-sex attracted adolescents that instead of being gay or lesbian, they may in fact be the opposite sex. And gender theory says that if you feel like a woman, you are a woman, regardless of your chromosomes, your genitals, regardless, in fact, of reality. Now, gender ideology is highly contested. It doesn't have a basis in science, and no one had heard of it in this country just 10 years ago. 
And yet it's been pushed on children in some schools under the guise of RSE with what can only be described as a religious fervour. DfE guidance states that schools should not reinforce harmful stereotypes, for instance by suggesting that children might be a different gender. And resources used in teaching about this area must be evidence-based. And yet a video produced by the Amaze group and used in schools suggests that boys who wear nail varnish or girls who like weightlifting might actually be the opposite sex. Resources by Brooke claim man and woman are genders. They are social ideas about how people who have vulvas and vaginas and people who have penises and testicles should behave. The Split Banana Group offers workshops to schools where children learn ideas of how gender is socially constructed and explore links between the gender binary and colonialism. A gendered intelligent workshop tells children that a woman is still a woman, even if she enjoys getting blowjobs. Just Like Us tells children that their biological sex can be changed. The PSHE Association resources inform children that people whose gender matches the sex they were assigned at birth are described as cisgender. And gender theory is even being taught to our very youngest children. The Popanoli group tells children that gender is male, female, both or neither. The Introducing Teddy book, aimed at primary school children, tells the story of Teddy, who changes sex illustrated by the transformation of his bow tie into a hair bow. The Diversity Role Models primary training workshop uses the gender unicorn, a cartoon unicorn who explains that there is an additional biological sex category called other. Numerous resources from numerous sex education providers present gender theory as fact, contrary to DfE guidance. But it's not just factually incorrect resources that are making their way into schools. Visitors from external agencies are invited in to talk to children about sex and relationships, sometimes even without a teacher present in the room. Guidance says that when using external agencies, schools should check their material in advance and conduct a basic online search. But a social media search of organisations such as diversity role models reveals links to drag queens with highly sexualised, porn-inspired names. Or in the case of mermaids, the promotion of political activism, which breaches political impartiality guidelines. In some cases, children are disadvantaged when they show signs of dissent from gender ideology, as we saw in the recent case reported in the press of a girl who was bullied out of school for questioning gender theory. I've spoken to parents of children who've been threatened with det detention if they misgender a trans-identifying child or who complain about the child of the opposite sex in their changing rooms. I've heard from parents whose child was marked down on their homework for not adhering to this new creed in their RSC work. Children believe what adults tell them. They're biologically programmed to do so. How else does a child learn the knowledge and the skills they need to grow and develop and be prepared for adult life? It's therefore the duty of those responsible for raising children, particularly parents and teachers, to tell children the truth. Those who teach a child that there are 64 different genders that they may actually be a different gender to their birth sex, that they may have been born in the wrong body, are not telling the truth. And it's a tragedy that the RSC curriculum, which should be helping children to develop confidence and self-respect, is instead being used to undermine reality and ultimately put children in danger. Now, some may ask what harm is being done by presenting these ideas to children. And of course it is right to teach children to be tolerant, kind and accepting of others. But it's not compassionate, wise or legal to teach children that contested ideologies are fact. That's indoctrination and it's becoming very evident that there are some quite concerning consequences. I certainly will. Uh, uh, giving away and uh, the progress she's making in this and I was uh, intrigued. But isn't also one of the other problems about this in a contested area like this is it actually leads further than that. It's not just a, a sense of indoctrination but it's also that there are physical uh, consequences to this because some of these uh, young people, children, will then end up going through medical processes which lead them to almost irreversible problems later on should this turn out to be something which is a problem for them and that I wonder whether she thinks that is also a potential consequence of what's been going on. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way and he is absolutely right. The problem is that these ideas do not just stay as ideas, they have very uh, serious physical consequences. And there's actually been a, a 4, 000, more than 4,000% rise in the referrals of girls to gender services over the last decade. And a recent poll of teachers suggests that at least 79% of schools now has trans-identifying children. 
Now, this isn't a biological phenomenon, it's social contagion, and it's driven by the internet and reinforced in schools. The Bayswater Support Group, which provides advice and support for parents of trans-identifying children, reports a surge of parents contacting them after their children are exposed to gender content in RSE lessons and in assemblies. And a large proportion of parents say their child showed no sign of gender distress until either a school assembly or RSE lessons uh, with those same topics. Children who are autistic, children who are same-sex attracted, those who don't conform to traditional gender stereotypes, or children with mental health conditions are disproportionately likely to identify as trans or non-binary. I certainly will. And of course, I've uh, heard evidence in the Bayswater Support Group as, as well, where parents who questioned uh, uh, children who'd come home from school and the school had supported uh, them wanting to uh, transition uh, were then contacted by social services because that could be construed in some way as, uh, as harm towards the, the child, which is frightening given they still have parental responsibility. She mentioned physical um, aspects. Isn't there also a mental health aspect to all of this? Teenagers who have so much to cope with uh, these days, young children, much more so than, when, than we were going through puberty and growing up in schools, all the pressures of social media, that almost to be forced to question their sex, and if they don't, there's something wrong with them, is putting extraordinary pressures uh, uh, on children, adding to all they have to go through in teenagers already. Can I thank my honourable friend for his intervention? And he is absolutely right. This is, is doing nothing but adding to the, the anxiety and the difficulty that uh, many teenagers are already facing. And that's why it's, it's even more important than ever that both parents and schools tell children uh, the truth and are truthful about, uh, about sex and relationships and gender and those things. Um, so when we think about uh, the um, vulnerability of children with autism or same-sex attracted children to some of these ideas, um, we can look at resources from the Chameleon Sex Education Group, which tells Tom's testimony. So Tom, a female, says, I guess I always felt different. Even on my first day at school, I remember not feeling like the other kids. I didn't realise at the time it was because of my gender identity. Now, when autistic or vulnerable children who are already struggling to fit in and to feel accepted are presented with an explanation for their difficulties, it's not surprising that they become attracted to it. Katie Alcott, the senior lecturer in developmental psychology at the University of Lancaster, told me uh, that children with autism, right through the primary and secondary years, struggle with the idea that other people think differently to them and that something can have an underlying essence that is different to its reality. So teaching autistic children that their feelings of awkwardness may stem from being born in the wrong body is surely a failure of safeguarding. In fact, children who tell a teacher at school that they are suffering from gender distress are then often excluded from normal safeguarding procedures. Instead of involving parents and considering wider causes for what the child is feeling and the best course of action, some schools actively hide the information from parents, secretly changing the child's name and pronouns in school, but using birth names and pronouns in communication with parents. One parent of a 15-year-old with a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome said that she discovered that without her knowledge, her daughter's school had started the process of socially transitioning her child and have continued to do so, despite the mother's objections. Another mother said, it's all happened very quickly and very unexpectedly, after teaching at school during year seven and year eight. As far as I can understand, the children were encouraged to question the boundaries of their sexual identity as well as their gender identity. Her friendship group of eight girls all adopted some form of LGBTQ identity, either sexual identity or gender identity. My daughter's mental health has deteriorated so quickly to the point of self-harm. And some of the blame is put on me for not being encouraging enough of my daughter's desire to flatten her breasts and to have puberty blockers. Some parents have indeed, as my honourable friend mentioned, been referred to social services when they've questioned the wisdom of treating their son as a girl or their daughter as a boy. Socially transitioning a child, changing their name and pronouns, treating them in public as the opposite sex is not a neutral act. In her interim report on gender services for children, paediatrician Dr Hilary Cass remarks that while social transition may not be thought of as an intervention or treatment, it is an active intervention because it may have significant effects on the child or young person in terms of their psychological functioning. The majority of adolescents who suffer from gender dysphoria grow out of it. But instead of safeguarding vulnerable children, schools are actively leading children down a path of transition. 
Now, if a child presented with anorexia and a teacher's response was to hide this from parents, celebrate the body dysmorphia and encourage the child to stop eating, I think that would be a gross failure of safeguarding. For a non-medical professional to make a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, exclude parents and encourage a child to transition is just such a failure. In some schools, children are not only taught about the concept of gender theory, they're also signposted to information about physical interventions. Last year, sixth formers at a grammar school sent a newsletter to girls as young as 11, detailing how to bind their breasts to look more masculine and how surgery can remove tissue if it hurts too much. And schools have played a major role in referrals to gender identity clinics, where children are sometimes set on a path to medical and surgical transition. Now, I'm really pleased to see the announcement from the Health Secretary today that he's commissioning a more robust study into whether treatment at these clinics improves children's lives or leads to later problems or regret. Because schools may think they're being kind, but the consequences of full transition, permanent infertility, loss of sexual function, lifelong health problems are devastating, as has become clear following the case of Kira Bell. Now, anyone hearing for the first time what's going on in schools might reasonably, reasonably ask, how can this be allowed? And the answer is, it isn't. DfE guidance tells schools that resources used in teaching about this topic must always be age-appropriate and evidence-based. Materials which suggest that non-conformity to gender stereotypes should be seen as synonymous with having a different gender identity should not be used. And you should not work with external agencies or organisations that produce such material. But many teachers just don't have time to look into the background of every group that provides sex education resources. And when faced with teaching such difficult and sensitive topics, they understandably reach for ready-made materials without investigating their source. But those teachers that are aware of the harms are sometimes afraid to share their concerns. A lot of teachers have written to me about this, and one teacher wrote, I left my job in a primary school after we were asked to be complicit in the social transitioning of a seven-year-old boy. This was after gendered intelligence came into school and delivered training. Relationships and sex education in this country has become a wild west. Anyone can set themselves up as a sex education provider and offer resources and advice to schools. Now imagine if someone with no qualifications could set themselves up as a geography resource provider, inserting their own political beliefs on a map of the world. Perhaps they'd put Ukraine inside the Russian border and then sell those materials to be used in schools. Some of these sex education groups I don't believe should have any place in our educational system. Indeed, the guidance says schools should exercise extreme caution when working with external agencies. Schools should not, under any circumstances, work with external agencies that take or promote extreme political positions or use materials produced by these agencies. And yet all of the organisations I've, I've mentioned today and many others fall foul of this guidance. What's more, the government is actually funding some of these organisations with taxpayers' money. For example, the Proud Trust, which received money from the tampon tax. Equality, te equality Teach and Diversity Role Models have received money from the DfE as part of anti-bullying schemes. We've created the perfect conditions for a safeguarding disaster where anyone can set up as an RSE provider, then be given access to schools, either through lesson materials or through direct access into the classroom. And yet parents, those who love a child most and are most invested in their welfare, are being cut out. In many cases, parents are refused access to the teaching materials being used with their children in school. This was highlighted in the case of Claire Page, reported at the weekend, who complained about sex education lessons taught in her child's school by an organisation called the School of Sexuality Education. Now, until this year, their website linked to a commercial site that promoted pornography. Mrs Page's daughter's school refused to allow the family to have a copy of the lessons provided, which it said were commercially sensitive. Schools are in loco parentis. Their authority to teach children comes not from the state, not from the teaching unions, but from parents. Parents should have full access to the RSE materials being used with their own children. We have created this safeguarding disaster, and we're going to have to find the courage to deal with it. I must say, she's making, I think, a compelling argument. I'm, and I suppose she must have, and must have talked to the education department about this prior to this, what I find very difficult is in everything else, she talked about geography or biology. These are all heavily inspected, and a school that departs from these uh, clear facts and teaches something different 
would immediately get a very bad report and be put into probably special measures. Yet when it comes to this subject, there seems to be no controls. Is that the case, or is it just that the education department seems to think that this is something that only schools can judge? And I thank my right honourable friend for his intervention, and I expect those are questions that um, the Minister uh, hopefully will answer, but, but he is right, and that is the source of the problem, that there isn't the same regulation or inspection criteria for these subjects, but it's even more of a problem for these subjects because they are contested. Now, if I, as a science teacher, if I was to Google uh, video of sodium being put into water, I'm not going to find anything that anyone disagrees with or that departs from the truth. The trouble with some of these topics is there is such a wide range of contested views that we even more need a set of regulations and a, an accepted curriculum. But I, you know, I, I will uh, come on to that. So I do think that parents should have full access uh, to the materials being used with their children. Um, now, we have created this safeguarding disaster and we're going to have to have the courage to deal with it for the sake of our children. And the Secretary of State for Health has rightly compared to the fear of causing offence, which may happen, uh, with fears of being called racist when discussing the Rotherham grooming gangs. Exposing children to extreme sexual practices and ideology, telling them it's all about choice, connecting them with adults they don't know, cutting out parents, labelling parents as harmful or even referring them to social services, hiding information about a child from those who love them most, there are strong parallels here with grooming practices. And is, I have no doubt that children will be more susceptible to being groomed as a result of the materials they're being exposed to. Now, how have we gone so wrong? We seem to have abandoned childhood. Just as in the COVID pandemic, where we sacrificed young for old, so in our approach to sex education, we're sacrificing the welfare and innocence of children in the interests of adult sexual liberation. In 2022, our children are physically overprotected. They have too little opportunity to play and supervise, to take responsibility, to mature and grow wise. Yet at the same time, they are being exposed to adult ideologies, being used as pawns in adults' political agendas and at risk of permanent harm. What kind of society have we created where teachers need to undertake a risk assessment to take pupils to a local park but where a drag queen wearing a dildo is invited into a library to teach preschool children. Parents don't know where to turn, and many parents I've spoken to tell me how they complain to schools and get nowhere. Even the response from the DfE comes back the same every time, telling parents that where an individual has concerns, the quickest and most effective route to take is to raise the issue directly with the school. The complaint system is therefore circular, and schools are left to mark their own homework. Ofsted don't seem to be willing or able to uphold the DfE's guidance. Indeed, Ofsted may be contributing to the problem. It was reported last week that Ofsted cites lack of gender identity teaching in primary schools as a factor in whether schools are downgraded. Now, there is a statutory duty for the Department for Education to review the RSE curriculum every three years. So the first review, I believe, is due next year. But can I urge the Minister to bring forward that review and conduct it urgently? I also understand that the department is currently in the process of producing guidance for schools on the area of sex and gender, so perhaps the minister could tell us when that will be uh, available. Now, while much of the RSE guidance is sensible, terms such as age-appropriate are too woolly and difficult to interpret. The guidance produced on political neutrality has been helpful, but I don't think this is fundamentally a political issue. It's a matter of taking an evidence-based approach to what knowledge and ideas a child is able to process at different stages of development. We don't try and teach babies to read, and we don't teach quantum mechanics to six-year-olds, because they're not developmentally ready. Neither should we teach about sexual pleasure or gender fluidity to prepubescent children, or about extreme sex acts to adolescents. The RSE guidance and framework must therefore be rewritten with oversight by experts in child development, and put on a statutory footing, to determine what should be taught, when and by whom. And the DfE should consider creating a set of accredited resources with regulatory oversight by Ofqual, Ofqual and consider mandating RSE to be taught only by subject specialists. Now, the department has previously said in correspondence that they are investing in a central package to help all schools to increase the confidence and quality of their teaching practice in these subjects, including guidance and training resources to provide comprehensive teaching in these areas in an age-appropriate way. So can the minister say when the central package will be ready? In light of the CAS review interim report, the department must write to schools with clear guidance about socially transitioning children, the law on single-sex facilities, and the imperative to include parents in issues of safeguarding. 
I do think also the department should conduct a deep dive into the materials being used in schools, the groups that provide these materials and their funding sources. I certainly will. Mick Fletcher. Work that uh, needs doing regarding this subject, but I think if, there's an old adage: you give me the child by the time you're seven, and I'll give you the man. While unfortunately the education department will be working on this, children are being uh, been exposed to this, and the damage could be being done actually as we speak now. So we could do with immediate action on this to withdraw some of this material with immediate effect while we do these deep dive studies. I think it's so, so important. It's happening now as we sat here. Children have been exposed to uh, um, items in their school that they shouldn't be and we need to do something immediately. Intervention, and I completely agree, and that's why I'm calling on the department to conduct this review urgently. Um, and I think it, it, you know, it's incumbent on, on parents and teachers to speak out when they see resources um, and, and to express concerns. But I'm afraid, unfortunately, at the moment, many teachers and parents are powerless, which is why we very much need um, the help of the department. Um, and actually, on that topic, I just wonder what the Minister's view is on the amendment to the school bill that has been tabled in the House of Lords that would require schools to allow parents to view the materials being used in RSE. Or another solution might be for the DfE to create a statutory obligation that schools can only use resources published on their website. That will put the onus on the third party providers to produce responsible, high quality material and place it available for public and academic scrutiny. Does the Minister not agree with me that sunlight is the best disinfectant and that parents have the right to know what their children are being taught, especially in matters of sex and relationships? Mr Chairman, relationships and sex education in schools is not fit for purpose. I have no doubt that there are many schools and many teachers doing an excellent job of delivering RSE in a way that helps children to prepare for adult life, as was intended. But from the sheer volume of evidence I have seen, I've spoken for 32 minutes, I honestly could speak for two hours with the materials I have been given. <laughs> I, I, I will uh, allow other honourable members to come in shortly, but the sheer volume of evidence I have seen, that I have, and the number of parents who have contacted me from all over the country, all different types of schools, it seems clear that for far too many children, RSE is exposing them to adult sexuality and adult ideology and is doing them harm. Most head teachers and, teachers and, and head teachers mean well, but they are overwhelmed by political pressure, too busy to investigate the source of materials, and too confused by guidance, which is too weak and sometimes contradictory. At the moment, it's left to dedicated parents groups, like the Bayswater Support Group, Transgender Trend, the Safe Schools Alliance, Parents for Education, and the Family Education Trust, to support parents, guide them to complaints procedures, and help them engage with schools. But fundamentally, it is the Department for Education that imposed the mandatory requirement for schools to deliver RSE, so it's the responsibility of the department to make sure that schools are equipped and held accountable to deliver it well. And I look forward to hearing from the Minister how the Department plans to clean up this mess uh, and to give our children the protection they deserve. Thank you. Uh, 